We're in Auckland, New Zealand, with Minako Hagen. Minako, welcome. Thank you, Anthony. Tell us, what do you do these days in, in Auckland? Um, I relocated to Auckland from Dublin, September mm -hmm. last year, 2016. So I'm still in induction mode, so okay. to speak. Yes, I, was, I lived in New Zealand before, but I was away for 15 years away okay. from New Zealand, so I'm kind of uh, yeah, readjusting myself. Okay. You're in a translation department here, or what? What, what is yes, your job? Yes, right now I'm in charge of translation studies mm -hmm. as part of European languages and literatures, and we are at School of Cultures, Languages, and Linguistics. It's okay. a big school. Yeah. And at is translation University. at undergrad or master's level here? We only offer postgraduate okay. degrees. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and your role within that, you're teaching what particular subject? So I've only just started in February, so I'm teaching transition theory using your mm -hmm. book. And uh, second semester I'll be teaching CAT, computer aided translation. Okay. And uh, community translation, community interpreting. Okay. Now Milaka, you don't look very, very um, Irish. Uh, where, where are you from originally? Then? Okay, so I'm from Japan, uh, okay. but my name is O'Hagan, is uh -huh. Irish name, because my husband's uh, ah, okay. ancestor comes right. from Ireland, but he is really Kiwi. Okay. So, New Zealand. Right? Yes, that's yes. right, New Zealand. Yes. yes. Uh, and so you came here, you lived in New Zealand for a long time, and then you were, most of your career in translation studies has been where then? Okay, so let me... Yeah, let's go back. Yeah, yeah let yeah. me start. So, I was working as a translator, government translator, for the New Zealand Department of Internal Affairs in Wellington. Okay. In my 20s. That's like the police. Yes. Okay. Yes, the Internal Affairs has translation service section. Okay. And we used to do all official certificates, death marriage certificates, oh, right, okay. birth certificates, yeah. and also technical documentation, um, like you know, a lot of exports of food stuff. Uh, and uh, the, at the time, a uh, big trade drive was on to export to Asia, mm -hmm. for example, to Japan. So we are translating marketing materials as well. Into Japanese? Into Japanese, okay. yes. Yeah. And this is all pre-internet mm -hmm. era. Mm -hmm. if you remember. So this is in eight, uh, early 80s. Yeah. So I was practicing translator. And at Had the you been time, trained as a translator? I, no, I'm an um, uh, English literature graduate okay. and I was always interested in text okay. and writing. Good. So that was a job I landed in uh, for the, yeah, um, when I started to leave New Zealand after I Mm -hmm. got married mm -hmm. to a Kiwi guy, New Zealand guy. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I was working there and really great introduction to this profession because I had to do all kinds of translation. Um, How did you get into academic life then? Okay, so that was a time when technology was just beginning to emerge. But at work I had to use a manual Japanese typewriter. I don't know if you've seen it. I have seen one. Yes, it's and as one, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we have thousands and thousands of characters, and that means if you're not trained typist, you have to visually search each character. So this used to slow me down. So tool used to slow me down mm -hmm. rather than my productivity is increased. So I took it to my business to really find out about technology to help my work. To, to be able to translate more efficiently. So the work at the time, I uh, used to subscribe to various trade journals, like I think Language International, mm -hmm. do you yep, remember? Sure. And I started to learn about new technologies coming on, uh, such as word processing, machine translation. So I started to um, develop real interest in it. So to cut the long story short, that took me to study translation technology formally at the university. But at the time there were no school of translation studies in New Zealand. So I studied my both masters and PhD in communications studies, practically analyzing the impact of technology in different professions, in the okay. Marquez translation profession. Okay. And that was your so, PhD as well? Yeah, that's right, yes, yes. Right. Yes. What year was that in then, if I could ask? So I used systems theory mm -hmm. and sort of Kuhn's idea of paradigm shift mm -hmm. and also 
sort of future forecasting using futures studies. Many people think that futures studies is to do with stock market, but it's mm -hmm. not. It's a, a forecasting tool that okay. if you um, present, okay, if this, this, this conditions exist, what could happen? So mm -hmm. that's the kind of uh, studies uh, that I was doing. So I did PhD. And when I finished PhD... When was that? What year? So was this PhD? was nearly um, 1999. Um, oh, okay, so we're talking real technologies at that stage. Which, yes, that's, yeah, that's right. Do you, uh, what do you mean? Machine translation, translation memories or other kinds of things? So well? translation memories just started in 1997. Uh, some, some very advanced translators translating from Japanese into English, uh, American translators are using translation memory, but mm. that was still there. Um, so that was all beginning to happen. Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So did you predict what, what has happened since then? I was always interested in network to use of technologies yeah. because it, it began to happen in the 90s, you know, because internet started to, to mm -hmm. emerge. And the whole idea is rather than um, uh, centralized control, this idea of distributed mm -hmm. uh, yeah, computing. So I was thinking, hmm, if machine translation was available, distributed, and also tools, and all translators are connected on the internet, uh, connect, at the time we didn't even use the word internet, on the network, then um, customers can plug in and whoever is available on the network uh, and good sort of profile in relation to client's demand can do the translation. So that was a kind of vague idea that I had. That That's what I call tele... sort of utopic. Yeah, yeah. well, tele-translation. Well, no, it, it has happened. Mm, yeah, it, it was quite practical. Yeah. And you see, because I was a practicing translator. It was your first so book on tele-translation, right? That was, yes, yeah. Yes, that yes, was okay. based on my master's mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. thesis, yeah. yeah. So, so that since there was no academic position for translation technology when I finished my PhD, I was looking wider, um, further the field, and then bumped upon this Dublin job, where I stayed nearly fifteen years. In Dublin. Yes. Okay. Yes. And there you were doing the technology, or other things as well. I slightly shifted my focus from um, machine translation per se to more audiovisual mm. translation. And initially I was going to combine, um, for example, production of subtitling using uh, machine translation, mm -hmm. but basically not as an automated translation, but as an aid producing draft translation for yeah. translators. Because at the time, the pricing for subtitling was going down, down, down. And so we are doing this project with a kind of devil's advocate to say to the film industry, you know, they're prepared to pay so much to actors, but if, we, if they have no money to pay to subtitles, then okay, we machine translate it. Mm -hmm. So that was a kind of motivation. So I did that a little bit at the beginning of my stay in Dublin, but then shifted really much more um, uh, audiovisual translation and then video game localization. And okay. then, yeah. So, so not just the translation technologies, at that stage, you're moving beyond yeah. that. Into so, so my interest in translation technology is very broad um, in a sense that I'm interested in this um, interface point between translation and technology. Mm -hmm. And of course, today we really cannot talk about translation without technology anyway. But I'm interested in uh, how technology affects to create new types of new modes of translation and also how technology is affecting users of translation. So that's mm. the sort of yeah, focus I have now. Your early, st well, up to your PhD, you're doing mm. studies of predictions of the future. Yes. Were your predictions fulfilled, do you think? Uh, in the sense of this networked world, okay, which that internet bit. world, that is. But something I did not ever think of is this empowered users. Um, I really never thought the time will come that crowdsourcing uh, becomes sort of legitimate way of serving certain translation markets. So that was something I really didn't um, even come into my picture. Without exploitation, do you think? 
It's ethically hugely problematic. Yes. Completely. Yeah. We're talking about, I don't know, Facebook, mm. uh, localization, mm. but also private companies. That, yes, that, exactly. You know, and the way that, for example, Facebook's case, they present uh, this is a for doing something for public good, as if it's a humanitarian mm. aid kind of thing. But of course, Facebook, a commercial, is a commercial money-making company, and users kind of forget that this is a commercial company because they use Facebook free. Mm. So, in a way, users are sort of tricked into thinking that they are given this free service, and therefore they don't mind using a bit of time okay. doing translation. Yeah. Milako, if you were looking around to do a doctoral thesis now, what, what kind of research do you think we need in translation studies, particularly in the technology field? Yes, well, I don't know if I can answer that question uh, in three minutes, but uh, I don't know what it should be done, but my interest right now is to really try to understand users, and especially Today's technology is allowing many companies like Amazon, Facebook, and Google to some extent to get automatically user data. Mm. And they're using that to improve their service. Mm. And why can't language service providers do that? I'm really interested in collecting user data mm -hmm. and really use that for the betterment of so the service. So are the users the people who read translations? Correct. Okay, yes. it's not clients, it's the end users. The end users, right. yeah, okay. yes. But of course, getting feedback from end users um, has been always very, very difficult, very tenuous link. And uh, work as, working as a translator, I hardly ever used to get feedback unless something is really wrong. Right, and only, I think, only negative feedback. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And even today, that we are all hooked up and in a wired world, still I think it's very difficult to get user feedback automatically. For example, in gaming industry, because I do research in gaming, um, online game companies, they automatically collect uh, gamer data you mm. know, when they're playing um, online games, like mm. Mark is doing, your mm. son Mark is doing. So they can use that data to redesign the game to make it more fun or more thrilling, etc. So I'd love to kind of think of a way to do the similar thing for translation. Okay, Milako, thank you very much. Pleasure. Okay.